Good morning and welcome to Kerry Baptist Church. My name is David, David McGowan. I'm one of the ministers here. It's good to welcome you to our morning service, uh, whether you're here with me in the chapel or whether you're watching online on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, welcome to students who are with us as I look around, see a number of students upstairs here uh, in the gallery. Welcome to you. Uh, there is a student lunch uh, immediately following this service, so that will be round at the Kerry Centre. So if you're a student, then please do uh, stay for that. Uh, if you're a visitor here or you're watching online and uh, you don't know much about the church and you'd like to find out more, then please do speak to uh, a member of our welcome team. They're wearing nice um, orange um, high-vis vests, so uh, you can spot them quite easily. They'll be happy to give you more details about what's happening here in the church. Uh, if you're online, then please do visit our church website. A couple of things to tell you about this evening. We have a communion service that's at six o'clock here at the chapel, uh, and Richard Baxter will be uh, leading that service. Uh, this Thursday, 7.45 uh, in the evening, we have an in-person church-wide prayer meeting. Uh, we haven't done that for a little while. Uh, we did have a morning of prayer recently on a Saturday. Uh, this is our first time on a Thursday evening gathering in person for prayer. That will be at the Kerry Centre. We'll try and maintain some social distancing there. So do come and join us if you're able, uh, 7.45 on Thursday. Next Saturday, a special event here in the chapel, uh, seven o'clock in the evening, good food, good questions. Pete Harris, uh, who was a member here at Kerry uh, when he was a UCCF staff worker, uh, but is now the UCCF team leader in Wales, and Pete Harris is going to come, uh, and he's going to be speaking. Uh, speaking about loneliness, um, don't just feel that you only need to come if you're lonely, uh, but if you um, just are aware of people who are lonely and want to think, how can you support them and encourage them and help them? Uh, then that would be a really useful evening. It's really evangelistic as well, so the gospel will be clearly presented. Uh, so maybe you'd be thinking about who you could invite to come along. It will also be live streamed and you can watch that on YouTube. An opportunity also for questions that evening. Uh, those questions can be um, sent in, texted in, uh, and then uh, Pete Harris will respond to those. And then next Sunday morning, 10.30, uh, here at the chapel, a guest service. And again, Pete Harris uh, will be speaking uh, on that occasion. Well, let me begin by reading Psalm 67. Psalm 67, uh, it says this, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. This morning, we're going to acknowledge harvest. Uh, we want to give thanks to God for his goodness expressed to us uh, in the provision of food. Perhaps we do that every mealtime. We pray and we say thank you to the Lord because ultimately he is the giver of all good things, but he's the giver of food that sustains our lives. Uh, so we can do that every day, but it's good once a year at harvest time uh, to acknowledge God's goodness, his faithfulness, that he has made this earth fruitful, uh, and so it provides food for us. Uh, we acknowledge God's faithfulness uh, in the rhythm of the seasons, uh, spring and summer and autumn and winter. Uh, now this year, as we celebrate harvest, we're not collecting food as we often do. We uh, often in the past have collected tins and dried food, and uh, that has gone to help those in need. We're not doing that uh, this year because of the continuing COVID restrictions. Uh, we are going to sing a, a very well-known harvest song in just a moment, uh, but also we're going to provide the opportunity to give, uh, to give money to help those who are in need. Uh, we're going to give money towards Christians who are in Myanmar. Uh, last February, there was a military coup in Myanmar uh, that has brought great political um, instability in the country. Uh, Christians, uh, even prior to that, were often persecuted and discriminated against, uh, and it's only got harder for them uh, since February. Last March, we collected quite a substantial sum of money here in the church uh, to help evangelical Christians in Myanmar. 
Uh, we have direct links with Myanmar, really through Basil Howlett, uh, one of our elders. Uh, that money has been dispersed to about five different groups uh, in Myanmar. We have ways of getting the money through to Myanmar, and it's been really helping people in very practical ways. Uh, we've had reports back. Um, some of the church leaders, uh, they've had to leave their homes uh, with their whole families just to abandon their homes and to seek refuge, safety in other places. Uh, COVID is still a huge uh, problem in Myanmar. Uh, we've had reports that many church pastors have died as a result uh, of the pandemic. Uh, so later in our service, we will be praying for uh, the church and for Christians in Myanmar. But an opportunity really just to express, well, God's goodness to us. And we want to share with our brothers and sisters in need. Uh, so there'll be a harvest offering for Myanmar. That will remain open for the next couple of weeks. Uh, you can put some money in the boxes uh, at the back of the, um, where you leave um, the building. Uh, just make sure that that's marked harvest or, or Myanmar. If you mark it harvest, there are some little envelopes, I think probably at the welcome desk that you can um, fill in just to put some money in. But uh, you can also give by direct bank transfer and uh, that's probably the best way uh, to give. And if you give in that way uh, to the church account, then please do put on the reference of that payment harvest uh, and then that money will go through to Myanmar. So we'll leave that open for a few weeks uh, and then send that money out to Myanmar. Well, what is this well-known uh, harvest hymn we're going to sing? Well, it's we plough the fields and scatter, uh, acknowledging God's uh, faithfulness, God's goodness to us and uh, wanting to give thanks then uh, to him, the God, the Lord of the harvest. So when the music starts, we're going to stand. We keep our face masks on in the morning uh, when we're here because we're not able to maintain full social distancing. Uh, so let's stand to sing God's praise as the music begins. Please be seated and let's 
pray. Let's come to God in prayer. Father God, we want to give you thanks as we gather here this morning. We are here to praise you, to adore you, to honor you, to acknowledge that you are the great God who rules over this universe. You are the one who has brought all things into being and every good gift comes ultimately from your hand. And so, Father, we want to come with grateful and thankful hearts as we rejoice in your generosity towards us and in the many ways in which you have blessed us. We thank you that you are a God of faithfulness and a God of fruitfulness, a God who has made this earth fruitful and productive. And we thank you that you have established seasons. And so we do have rain and sunshine that comes and swells the grain. And we thank you that this is testimony to your faithfulness as year by year a harvest is reaped. Father, we do pray that you would help us to recognize just your goodness in our lives and that you are the God who is faithful to all your promises. You are loving and you are kind and you are generous and gracious towards us. Thank you that you do supply uh, our daily bread and for us here, uh, so much more than just our daily bread. So many things that we have that bring comfort and ease to our lives. Father, we pray that you would forgive us if so often we take it for granted, the good things that we enjoy, or if we perhaps feel that these things are things that we have earned or worked for. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us to recognize you as the giver, and we are the stewards of the good gifts that you've given to us. And help us to exercise responsible stewardship uh, over the resources that you've given to us here on earth, and the resources that you've given to us as individuals, and collectively together, Uh, as a church. Father, we pray that we would be uh, ever more thankful uh, for your good providence uh, in our lives. Father, we thank you that you are concerned not just for our physical well-being, uh, but also for our spiritual well-being. Thank you that we do not live by bread alone, uh, but we thank you that you have revealed yourself, uh, revealed yourself in creation, revealed yourself through your word, uh, and we pray that we would feed uh, our souls upon your word But we thank you, too, that you have revealed yourself supremely in the sending of the Lord Jesus, God the Son, into the world to be our Savior. Father, we pray this morning that as we are gathered here for worship, that truly that we would incline our hearts towards you. We pray that we would come humbly, acknowledging our wrongdoing, confessing readily our sins to you and seeking forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And Father, we pray that the knowledge of the salvation that comes through Jesus uh, would thrill our souls, would stir up our spirits, that we might worship you as you alone deserve. So Father, we pray that you would be with us and help us. We pray for the children uh, in creche and those in Sunday school, the various Sunday school groups. Father, we pray that you would be with them and encourage them and help them that they might learn more of you, that they might learn more of the Saviour. Uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, Watch over them, be with them, and bring them each uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. So, Father, we look to you. We pray that uh, as you receive our worship, that we would be attentive, that we might hear your word, and that you would speak to us uh, and speak right into our hearts uh, and minds by your Spirit uh, and draw out our hearts uh, in saving faith in Jesus Christ. Hear us then. Help us. Be with us and bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're starting a new series in the book of Colossians in the New Testament. Uh, And so our Bible reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, and it's verses 1 to 8. And Caroline uh, Davis is going to come and read that for us. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. So I'm reading from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Paul, an apostle, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope 
that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, well, we're going to sing what really is a prayer, asking that the Lord would speak to us uh, as we come to his word, that uh, we would give full attention to God's word, that we might hear him speaking to us. So we're going to stand and sing, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. If you have a Bible, whether that's um, a paper version or on your phone, then please do turn uh, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. The book of Colossians in the New Testament is a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul and his assistant Timothy. 
to the church in a place called Colossae. Uh, we learn about that in the opening greeting, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 3. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Uh, Paul there is writing to a church. Uh, Paul and Timothy working together in gospel ministry. Uh, and they're writing to a group of Christians who are meeting in the city of Colossae. Uh, Colossae was a city in the province of Asia uh, that was part of the Roman Empire. Uh, the site of that ancient city now lies in modern Turkey. Uh, and if you were to go to the site of ancient Colossae, uh, there would be very little to show for what was once a thriving cosmopolitan city. Uh, indeed, at the time when Paul was writing this letter to the Christians in Colossae, Colossae was already in decline. Uh, it was being superseded in importance by the neighboring cities of Hierapolis and Laodicea. But Paul here is writing to the church in Colossae. Now, Colossae is not mentioned as a place where Paul preached in the book of Acts. Although the church probably did come into being during the time when Paul was in Ephesus. Paul spent a number of years in Ephesus and he was teaching and preaching there. And we read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10 that while Paul was in Ephesus, and Ephesus was about 100 miles away from Colossae, but that while Paul was in Ephesus, all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So as Paul was there in Ephesus, there were people who were going out and spreading the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. And perhaps at that time, most probably at that time, uh, the church in Colossae came into being. Now, the person who brought the gospel to Colossae was a man named Epaphras. Uh, and Epaphras is mentioned here in chapter 1, verse 7, uh, and also in chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm not going to say too much more about Epaphras because Epaphras is one of the unsung heroes that we're looking at on Sunday evenings. So if you want to know more about Epaphras, then come back next Sunday evening uh, and we'll be looking at his life. But even though Paul has not visited Colossae, he has heard about the church from Epaphras. And in response to what Epaphras has told him, Paul writes this letter to encourage the church. And in the course of this letter, Paul will assert the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He will warn against false teaching. He will call the church in Colossae to live out their faith. And in so doing, to bring glory to God and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. But before all of that, Paul gives thanks to God for what he has heard about this church. Uh, let me read again verses 3 to 6. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Paul writes, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. Now, Paul doesn't use the word virus or viral in those verses there in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, the word virus, of course, has really entered into uh, regular conversation over the past 18 months in biology and medicine. Uh, a virus is a tiny infectious agent that can multiply in the living cell, in li any living cell, uh, but particularly in animals and, uh, and in humans, as we know. Uh, COVID, coronavirus, uh, some viruses can spread very easily and indeed can be lethal. In computing, a virus is a program or a piece of code uh, that propagates itself within the memory of a computer uh, or across a network, usually with adverse consequences. Uh, and many of us have antivirus software uh, on our computers. The adjective viral is applied to videos or posts that spread rapidly 
across social media. Now, Paul doesn't use the word virus or viral, but look at what he says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6. He says that all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. The gospel has gone viral. It's spread rapidly, says Paul. Now, certainly at the time when Paul is writing this letter, the good news concerning Jesus Christ, that's the gospel. The good news concerning Jesus Christ has spread rapidly. It spread from Jerusalem across the Roman Empire, through the province of Asia, and on into Europe. Many people have been converted in many places, and many churches had come into being. And Christians were growing spiritually also. Their love for God was deepening. Their understanding of God's will was increasing. They were becoming more like Christ themselves. They were active in witnessing. They were giving financially to support those who were in need. They were willing to suffer loss and persecution rather than renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And in the 2,000 years since Paul wrote this letter, the gospel has continued to grow and to bear fruit in the lives of millions of people. Now, there have been times and places where gospel growth has been rapid and extensive. Seasons of reformation, seasons of revival. There have been times also when gospel growth has been much harder and much slower. Looking back, even over the last 50 years, there has been huge gospel growth in places like Latin America and Africa and China and Iran. But over the last 50 years, there are also places where gospel growth has been very slow. For example, here in Europe. But as we have already seen, the gospel came to Colossae through the faithful ministry of Epaphras. The gospel was growing at that time. This church had come into being. At the end of verse 6, Paul says, referring to the gospel, that the Christians in Colossae, they heard it, they heard the gospel, and they understood God's grace in all its truth. It's a lovely little phrase there. The gospel, says Paul, is God's grace in all its truth. We learn two things from that phrase. Firstly, that the gospel expresses the grace of God, the grace of God. What is grace? Well, grace is getting what we don't deserve. The gospel expresses God's grace towards us. You know, we experience God's grace in so many ways. Every good thing that we have, every good thing that we enjoy has come from God. We were thinking of that right at the beginning of our service as we think about harvest, about the provision of food. That's an expression, a token of God's common grace to all humanity. Humanity has turned away from God, generally rebelled against God, and yet God is still gracious, kind, loving, generous towards us, uh, providing food for us. But the most glorious expression of God's grace is the coming of God the Son into the world as Jesus Christ to be humanity's Savior. The gospel expresses God's grace so clearly, so wonderfully. The coming of Jesus, God the Son, into the world is an expression of God's grace willingly as he is crucified. You see, Jesus takes upon himself the full punishment that sin deserves so that anyone and everyone who trusts in him is forgiven all their wrongdoing. Jesus endures hell, which he does not deserve, so that people like us can enjoy heaven, which we do not deserve. This is grace. This is God's grace. God's amazing grace revealed to us in the sending of his son, Jesus, to be our savior. The gospel is God's grace. That's what Paul says. The gospel is God's grace. But secondly, he says it's God's grace in all its truth. The gospel is true. The gospel is true. I wonder how much thought you've given to the ultimate questions of life. 
What are the ultimate questions of life? Well, here are some ultimate questions of life. Where did matter originate? How did life begin? What makes me, me? What is the purpose of life? Are we alone in the universe? Is there a spiritual realm? Is physical death the end? Who defines what is right? Who defines what is wrong? Why is there so much suffering in the world? These are the ultimate questions of life. And people answer those ultimate questions in different ways. There are so many different worldviews, so many different philosophies of life, so many different religions in the world. But what is the truth? What is the reality? What is the truth? Well, the truth, according to the Bible, is that there is a God. There is a God, and atheism really has no excuse because there are evidences of God's presence all around us. And this universe that he has brought into being and that he sustains, God's DNA is all over the place. And what is this God like? Well, the Bible tells us that God is wonderfully glorious. He is almighty, all-powerful. He is holy and he is also gloriously gracious, loving and kind, merciful, compassionate. The Bible tells us that God has given us instructions as to how we should live. The Bible warns us that one day God will judge us, will hold us accountable for how we have lived before him in his world. According to the Bible, none of us have pleased God. Uh, none of us deserve God's attention. None of us deserve to know God because all of us have sinned against God. We deserve only punishment from God. And yet in his amazing grace, God has provided for us a savior. God has provided a savior for humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ through whom we can be forgiven all our sin, through whom we can be reconciled to God, through whom we can have a glorious future. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And Paul says that as Jesus Christ is preached, as that gospel goes out, as that gospel grows and bears fruit all over the world, this is God's grace in all its truth. This truly is God's grace. I wonder whether you think the gospel is true or not. Do you believe what the Bible teaches about our sinfulness, about our need of salvation, about God's gracious provision in the sending of God the Son into the world to be our Savior as we trust in him? Do you believe that this is true? And if not, if you don't believe that this is true, then, well, what answers do you have to those ultimate questions of life? How would you answer those ultimate questions of life? Here, Paul tells us that the members of the church in Colossae, they heard the gospel and they understood that the gospel was God's grace in all its truth. And they responded to the gospel and what impact, what effect did it have in their lives? What were the consequences of them understanding that the gospel is God's grace in all its truth? Well, Paul tells us in verses 4 and 5 that Paul commends the church in Colossae for three things. He commends them for their faith in Christ Jesus. He commends them for the love that they have for all the saints. And he commends them for the hope that they have of heaven. Three things, three characteristics of true Christianity. If I were to take off my wedding ring and look inside it, uh, stamped inside there are a series of symbols stamped into the metal. And those symbols are the hallmark. And the hallmark authenticates that this ring is made from real gold, not some cheap and worthless substitute. 
How do I know that it's real gold? Because there's a hallmark inside. And Paul here in verses four and five identifies the hallmarks of true Christianity. Three characteristics that are true of those who love and trust and serve and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at each of those in turn. Firstly, to be a Christian, there must be faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus. You know, faith is so much more than merely believing that Jesus was a historical person who lived 2,000 years ago on earth. Faith is more than just an intellectual assent to uh, maybe what is described here in the Bible in terms of some of the aspects of his, his life on earth. Faith is an understanding of the true identity of Jesus, a recognition that he is the eternal God, the Son, who has come into the earth, who has added a human nature to his divine nature, and he is a unique person who is both fully man and fully God, the perfect mediator between God and humanity. And faith is to accept that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Savior that was promised from of old. That he is the one who comes to fulfill God's plan of salvation for humanity. It is to believe that Jesus offers us total forgiveness as we come acknowledging our wrongdoing, freely acknowledging our faults and failings and putting our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ alone that we might be made right with God, that we might be forgiven. Faith in Christ Jesus is realizing that your only hope is in Jesus. And it's entrusting your life and death to Jesus. Faith is in Jesus Christ is like a skydiver who jumps out of an airplane and is trusting the parachute that is upon her back. Faith is the scuba diver who is deep under the ocean and who is entrusting themselves to the oxygen cylinder and the breathing apparatus on their back. Faith is entrusting ourselves life and death to Jesus Christ. Without whom there is no salvation. Is your faith in Christ Jesus? Have you heard the gospel? Have you understood that it is God's grace in all its truth? And have you put your faith, your trust in him, in Christ Jesus? Faith in Christ Jesus, that's the first hallmark, the first characteristic of true Christianity. Secondly, true Christianity is characterized by love for all God's people. It was Jesus himself who described love for one another as a hallmark of true faith. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, and you command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will all men, will all people know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, Christians are people who have personal experience of the amazing grace of God, of that love that God has shown us that we do not deserve. And how do we then respond to that love? Well, we put our trust and hope in Jesus Christ, and then we want to live like Christ. We want to obey his commands, and we want to show others the same sort of love that we ourselves have experienced. We want to extend grace to others, even as we have received grace from God. Selfless, sacrificial love towards others that we ourselves have known through Jesus Christ. Now in verse 4, Paul here commends the Christians in Colossae for their love for all the saints. Uh, maybe you hear that word saints and uh, you have in your mind uh, something quite different from what is intended. Uh, saints are not mega holy, super spiritual Christians. Saints is a term that is used in the New Testament for ordinary Christians. For anyone and everyone who is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying here is that this church has love for all of God's people. 
or the others around them in the church who are also trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be true, really, of every Christian and indeed of every Christian church, that it should be characterized by love for all God's people. And love for all God's people is not just loving those in our own local church, but it's loving our brothers and sisters who are part of the family of faith, who are living in other parts of our nation and other parts of the world. And indeed, what we're doing at this harvest time as we have an offering for Myanmar is to support our brothers and sisters who are in great need in another part of the world. We're expressing love for all God's people. We're to do that, yes, here where we are, but also as we have opportunity to love God's people in other parts of the world. What are the hallmarks of true Christianity? Faith in Christ Jesus, love for all God's people, and then thirdly, a hope of heaven. In verse 5, Paul says to the Christians in Colossae that their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all the saints, all of God's people, it springs from the hope that they have, a hope that is stored up for them in heaven. They have a hope of heaven. It's stored up, it's secure, it's kept safe for them. It's a sure and a certain hope that they have. See, the church in Colossae is looking forward through time to eternity. Their faith in Christ Jesus, yes, it's active in the present. It's being worked out here and now as they show love to all of God's people. But it's also a faith that is looking forward a faith that is looking forward expectantly to what is yet to come. Their faith is looking forward to the glorious future that is promised to all who trust in Christ Jesus. Their hope is in Christ Jesus, who promises eternal life in heaven and a new creation for everyone who puts their trust in him. They've got a forward-looking faith. You see, Christians are full of hope for the future, for the ultimate future. Even if our experience here and now in the present is hard, even if our experience in the immediate future is difficult, we're looking to eternity. And our hope is in heaven. We're looking forward to being with God forever, to finally seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory and enjoying unspoiled fellowship with God himself, with the Lord Jesus Christ with all of God's people who are gathered together in a perfect place where our joy will finally be full and complete and unending. There is so much more ahead of us to be enjoyed. And it's that certain hope of heaven that keeps us pressing on and persevering in our faith when things are tough, when we're suffering, or when we're struggling. As the 17th century Puritan Thomas Brooks put it, hope sees heaven through the thickest clouds. Hope sees heaven through the thickest clouds. There are days, aren't there, where there are heavy clouds and we cannot see the sun. And it all seems dark and dull and gloomy. The thickest clouds. But hope sees heaven beyond the thickest clouds. We know that one day those clouds, those difficult circumstances will pass. And that we will enter into glory. That we will enter into the presence of God himself. And that then all our suffering and all our struggles and all our sorrows will be over forever. The hope of heaven, the hope of heaven it really spurs us on from that springs, yes, our faith in Christ Jesus and our love for all God's people. What are you hoping for? What are you looking forward to? What do you believe is your ultimate future? 
Do your future plans extend beyond death? Do your future plans extend into eternity? Do you have the hope of heaven? Here, Paul begins this letter to the church in Colossae. And he gives thanks to God. He praises God because, well, the gospel, it's bearing fruit, it's growing. That's happened in the experience of these Christians in this church. As Epaphras has reported to Paul on what's happening in the church, there is so much that Paul can give thanks for. Yes, he'll address maybe some of the issues that they're facing later in the letter, but he begins with thanksgiving. And he sees the characteristics of true Christianity. These are people who've heard the gospel and they've understood that it is God's grace in all its truth. And that's evident because of their faith in Christ Jesus, the love that they have for all the saints and the sure and the certain hope that they have of heaven. These are the ways in which the gospel bears fruit in individual lives. These are the ways in which the gospel bears fruit in a church. The harvest of the gospel seed that is sown in the life of the Christian is faith and love and hope. The harvest of the gospel seed that is sown in the life of the Christian is faith, faith in Christ Jesus, love, love for all God's people, and hope, the hope of heaven. The question, of course, I want to leave you with this morning is this. Are these hallmarks, these characteristics indelibly stamped into your life? Do you have faith in Christ Jesus? Do you have love for all God's people? And do you have the hope of heaven? If you've never done so before, then why not come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Come confessing your sin, asking him to be your savior, recognizing that Jesus is the most glorious expression of God's grace, that he is the truth, and that you can safely entrust your life and death and eternal future to him. All over the world, the gospel is growing and bearing Fruit. We're going to sing of that. And then after we have sung this hymn, please be seated and then I'll lead us in prayer in response uh, to God's word. But this hymn, from the sun's rising unto the sun's setting, Jesus our Lord shall be great in the earth. Speaking of that harvest uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is gathering, uh, a harvest of people uh, from all over the world. Let's stand to sing as the music begins.
be seated. Let's pray that in response to God's word. Father, we thank you for this letter written to the Colossians, to that church in Colossae nearly 2,000 years ago, and yet uh, speaking about characteristics of true Christianity that remain uh, ever valid even today. And we pray that you would help us as we examine our own lives, that you would work by your spirit and give us understanding that we might recognize that in Jesus Christ, we have that supreme expression of your grace in all its truth. And Father, we pray that within each of us, that you would help us to come to an understanding of our need of salvation, that it is only through the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have our sins forgiven, that we can be reconciled to you. Father, we pray that you would grant each of us faith in Christ Jesus, that faith that is an entrusting of ourselves, our lives, our death, our ultimate futures to the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing him personally to be our savior and then living for him as the Lord of our lives. And Father, we pray that we would give expression to the fact that we are following the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are his disciples by the way in which we show love towards others towards all who are around us, but particularly and especially to those who are our brothers and sisters in the faith within the local church and indeed in our care and our concern for Christians in other parts of the world. Father, we pray that you would help us in the showing of love within our own church fellowship here. We pray for those amongst us who are suffering, those who are sorrowing, those who are struggling. And we pray for those who are in hospital. We pray for Noah Guest, we thank you for the surgery that took place on Wednesday. We thank you that that seems to have been successful. We pray for Noah as he recovers from that surgery. And we think of him being sick yesterday. We pray that he would recover. We pray that you would strengthen him. We pray that you would bring healing. Father, we pray that he would be able to be discharged and return home, perhaps even later today. Let be with Jeff and Ishan, his parents, and with Joshua, his brother, and Father, we pray as a family, they would continue to know your peace and your presence. We pray for Christine Baisley in hospital following hip surgery. We pray that she would recover quickly. We pray that you would help her as she becomes mobile once again. And we pray that soon she might be able to be discharged. Father, we pray for those who are undergoing treatment. We pray for Janice Jackman. We pray for Verna Luttrell. We pray that you would be with them and help them. We pray for Janice as she has further tests and awaits the commencement of a clinical trial. We pray that that might be effective. Uh, Father, we pray too for Verna. We pray for the chemotherapy and radiotherapy that she will undergo. We pray that you would give her strength. Father, we pray that you would bring healing. We pray for those who are sorrowing. We continue to pray for Norman Boyd. Uh, Father, we thank you for Beryl. We thank you for her long life and a faithful life a life of cheerful witness to her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we pray for Norman in his loss and the absence of Beryl. Father, we pray that you would draw near to him and help him. We pray too for Betty Gregory's family. We pray for her two sons and her daughter, for John and Paul and Ruth. We pray, Father, that you would be with them and help them and their children, grandchildren. We thank you for Betty's life, and we do pray for that service of thanksgiving to be held in two weeks' time that it would be an occasion in which we are able to give thanks to you for every evidence of your grace in Betty's life and that that would be a witness to others. Father, we want to pray this morning for your people who are facing persecution for their faith in Christ Jesus. We want to pray particularly for Christians in Myanmar. We think of these past months since the military coup in February of the uncertainty that there has been, the violence that there has been in response to demonstrations. We think of Christians who already were hard pressed and are now struggling even more. Father, we think of churches, Christians, pastors who are fearful. We think of those who've had to leave their homes because of the threat to their lives, of those who are now refugees and seeking shelter elsewhere. Uh, we think of the impact of COVID and so many pastors who have died uh, from the infection as they have helped and ministered to others. Father, we pray that you would meet the needs of your people. We pray that you would protect them 
We pray that you would provide for them. Uh, thank you for the contact that we have as a church with a number of evangelical groupings and church leaders uh, in Myanmar. And we do pray that as we give money, that that might be used effectively. That we pray that it would reach Myanmar and be able to do much good. Uh, Father, that it would be used to support your people, but also even as they are generous and gracious uh, and extend what they have to others, we pray that it might serve as a witness to the gospel. Uh, Father, we think of the gospel growing and bearing fruit uh, all over the world, and we pray that that would continue to be so. Uh, we long that we might see more of that progress, gospel progress, in our own community and in our own land. We pray that you would help us to continue to persevere and witness. Uh, Father, we pray that we might continue to live out our faith day by day, even uh, through the struggles that we face. We pray that we would have that hope of heaven before us, uh, that that joy that is set before us it would prompt us uh, to press on, to persevere in faith. Father, we pray that you would give us the strength that we need. We pray that we might have that resilience and that determination, that we would continue to share the good news with others, recognizing that it is your grace in all its truth. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've just been singing, is gathering a harvest of people drawn from all the nations. And so we pray that the gospel, yes, that it would bear much fruit in our own lives, but also that it might bear much fruit across the world as more and more people come to trust in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you that we've been able to worship you, to praise you, and to give thanks to you. Thank you that we have heard your word, and we pray it would continue to be at work in our lives under the work of your Holy Spirit. Impress it upon us. Father, we don't want to be people who, having heard your word and maybe being confronted with something in our own lives and uh, maybe challenged about our response to your word, to then just go away and to forget all about it. But we pray that we would put your word into practice in our lives, that we might respond to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and in glad obedience, that we would go from here seeking to glorify you and to glorify Christ, our Savior. Hear us then, help us, and as we go, may we grow in the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, that's our service over this morning. Good for you to be here and uh, to be able to worship together. Uh, thank you for those who have joined online. Meeting again at six o'clock this evening, our communion service here at the chapel. Thank you.